What a wonderful person, what wonderful things you have done without meaning it. You have to find something in that person. And she said one day, this woman told us, she said one day, a little boy brought, was brought into my class who was a most difficult child. And he was disturbing so much that the whole class was disturbed, the whole day. And she said, I looked at him, I tried to find out what good quality I can find in him and I couldn't. <laughs> there was no good quality that she could find to uh, praise him or to help him, to encourage him. I remember I said to him, well, couldn't you do something, well, send him out of this school, out of the room for a while if he's disturbing everybody. Oh, she said, no, if I do that, my relationship is ruined. It's no use. I cannot do that. I must find something. And she said when we were sitting after a while, I noticed that, you know, all the children in school, most of them, when they sit, uh, they stoop over their desk, you know, they just sit down like this. They stoop and they are bending more or less. But she said, I saw that this fellow Billy is sitting straight. Now that was good enough to start him. So she said, she announced to the whole class, she said, I want all of you to look at Billy. You see how marvelous he is, how straight he sits. Now I want you all to sit like Billy. Now Billy had never heard anybody praising him. And now he, uh, he, his eyes opened and he began to look around. He saw he became the center of attraction. Everybody looked at him. Everybody st sat straight. Now, Billy becomes excited. He, he sits there. And uh, he, he is no longer going to be difficult. And uh, all the children, every session when they come in, uh, the teacher reminds them, now don't forget, you all have to sit like Billy. And what Billy does, he is so excited about it. Because everything he has been doing, he has been, everybody has been attacking him more or less, of all the wrong things he's doing. Now he's going to find, to do something else which is going to be good. So that the teacher might encourage him again. You see, this is a marvelous lesson. This is what our institutions really are doing and will be doing and should be doing really. And ourselves. And I think that encouragement. I'm sure some of the believers who are discouraged and who are not, who are left alone. If you find them, anybody like that. If you find what good qualities they have and try to encourage that good quality. And say to them that you can serve the faith in that way through this particular ability that you have that nobody else has. We will become excited and they will come close to us. Now uh, as I mentioned this question of loving each other and not trying to judge one another is very important. Because uh, Shoghi Effendi in one of his writings he mentions this. He mentions that the function of the individual in relation to another individual is to love each other and to be compassionate and to be loving but not to judge. Whereas he says the function of the institutions of the faith, the function of the local assemblies and the national assembly is to apply justice. And when you apply justice you cannot become compassionate. And Shoghi Effendi says at the present time it's the reverse. The individual Baha'is, when they come together, they judge each other and they act towards each other as if one is a local assembly judging the other person and criticizing. And the local assemblies, when it comes to give order, national assemblies, when they come to um, apply justice, they become compassionate. Every Baha'i has marvelous qualities and we have to look into their faces and see those qualities of Baha'u'llah. I'll tell you another story just to give you this. You know that uh, sometimes there are difficulties in Baha'i communities and uh, there was a community in Europe, a Baha'i community which had great personal problems, personality problems, personality problems. You can never solve personality problems by 
expedient measures. You cannot solve them by expedient measures. And uh, the only way you can really do it is to shower everyone with love. And anyhow, in my function, I was asked to go and see if I can help them. Well, there was a big file, which if I show you the size of it, it was as big as this, about this community, of all the problems they had with each other. That, uh, some of them even wouldn't talk to each other. If they saw each other in the streets, they would avoid each other. It was a terrible situation. And they said that it was obvious from reading these files. I decided not to read them and at the end. I decided it's no good to read them. But I knew there was one man who they said he was the culprit. He was the responsible man. He really was the man who has created all this terrible entanglement and problems for years. And people had gone there, national assemblies, members, all kinds of people, board members, gone there to, to try to solve it and it became always worse to such an extent that these people had a great um, prejudices against the institutions of the faith. It became very difficult. Well, <laughs> I went along and I met with these people. Not, not that man who was all the cause of the difficulties. But I met with all the others and I found that they were beautiful Baha'is. <laughs> really and truly. <laughs> they were just beautiful Baha'is. You couldn't see anything bad in them. Oh, marvelous. And uh, we talked about it individually with everybody. And then I was afraid to go and see that man. I had to go and see him anyhow. That was the problem. And I reached to the almost to the door of this house. Before I ring the bell, it suddenly occurred to me very clearly that I am going there with the wrong feelings. You know, because I've read some of these files, it's no good. And I knew that this man must have marvelous qualities. Now this story of disagreement, the, the, the the story of this community is such that for years and years and years this has been going on and it could not be resolved and this man was obviously the source of all the problem I have no doubt about it this was in this file you could see that but he I, I decided immediately before I rang the, I rang the bell to really uh, purify my motive. I, I couldn't go like this. That he has some good qualities. Of course he has. He must have. He's a Baha'i. After all, he is a Baha'i. That's great. That's good enough. So with that feeling, I rang the bell. Now, I can tell you that uh, he and his wife were sitting there waiting for two or three days, trembling with fear of they're going to see the angel of death, or what's that what you call it? <laughs> when he comes. They were frightened of what's going to happen now, you know. Well, I, when I looked at this face of this woman, I just looked at it, just as I'm looking at your faces. And this woman almost melted. And she went running to the, her husband. I could hear whispering, saying to her that he, he's not that bad, you know. <laughs> he's not that bad at all, but we were thinking about it. Anyhow, this man came and we sat down and we embraced each other and we sat down. And I thought, what a wonderful thing it is to meet another Baha'i. You know, and we talked about our experiences in the faith, of his services, what he has been. And we talked and talked about all the stories. We became so heated up with excitement. And he went in and he brought, brought showed me all the years and years of service this man had. Of all the photographs of the friends in the old countries, in other countries that he has been, in other things he had done. A very learned person he was, and we talked about the faith. We went into all the, uh, the, the te some of the abstruse writings of Baha'u'llah, and he said something, and I said something, and it three hours we were discussing these things. We became so much enthused. And then at the end of it, I thought, now I better say nothing about his problems. And I said, well, now I better go. I decided I'll leave it for some other time. I'll come back again tomorrow. And I was going to go. 
And do you know what he did? He grabbed me. He said, all of this problem in this town is my fault. He said, everything is my fault. I didn't say the word. He said, I want you to do something. He said, I want you to accompany me to go to the houses of the believers. Now, these are the people he wouldn't talk to. He wouldn't see them. He wouldn't ever, ever, ever. And he said, I want to prostrate myself at their feet and beg forgiveness. I hadn't said anything to him. We never entered the subject. And you know we did that. He came along. We went up. We knocked on the doors. And people were startled to see him coming to the door of his house. And he literally, literally, he, he prostrated himself. He cried and cried and cried. And the others cried and cried and cried. And then we went to somebody else's house. And the same thing happened. And in the evening we gathered all the friends together. After two or three years. And it was a, it was a crying meeting all the time. They were crying. <laughs> and ever since they felt so united, so happy. And then the faith grew in that town. Local people became Baha'is. Now you see, and we never said a word about what this man had done. We have to really genuinely in our approach to people is to see a trace of Baha'u'llah in every soul, in every face all problems will vanish, I can assure you <laughs> this is how the faith works this is the power that he has released for us God, he has released this tremendous power and this power is not for, for me or for you or for him this power is for everybody there is no exclusiveness here Every one of us can draw from this power. Every one of us can attract him to ourselves. Well, we were talking about <laughs> something different. You remember we were saying that to read the writings and to say your obligatory prayers is not sufficient unless we carry out the teachings of Baha'u'llah. Obey his laws. And uh, to um, and then to love one another. It's one of the most important teachings. And if you love one another, everything else will work out. <laughs> and don't force yourself to love, but try to love. Uh, try to see if there is any problem somewhere. To approach it in this way that we are all uh, have. We all have to go from this life. You know this. We are not going to be here always. Every one of us will have to go. And uh, the, this is not a place to enter into. Um, this is not, this, this years, these years that we are living here is not a place that we should um, try to uh, judge each other and say, oh, this person is so irritating to me or that person is so difficult. Now, here is where we have to turn to the writings and see what are the teachings of Baha'u'llah and do it for his love. He says, carry out my commandments. I'm paraphrasing the words of Baha'u'llah. Carry out my commandments for the love of my beauty. We do not carry out the teachings of Baha'u'llah because it's good for us. This is a very important point to remember. Um, we don't carry out the teachings because, oh, if I carry out the teachings of Baha'u'llah, I am going to be wise, I'm going to be a good man, I'm going to be a very wise, a very knowledgeable man. This is not the real motive again. Uh, although at first when you become a Baha'i, naturally you see the teachings and you say it's marvelous to become adorned with all these characteristics and beautiful things that the faith has. But, the, but when you become a deeper Baha'i, you realize uh, that you do can't obey the teachings of Baha'u'llah for the love of Baha'u'llah. This is a marvelous motive. Because you love him. Again, remember... When you love somebody, go back to nature, go back to life. When you love somebody, and you really love somebody, and I'm talking of real love, 100% love, <coughs> when you really love somebody, you will not question what your beloved wants. You just do it because you love that person. You see? This is the real motive. The real relationship. Although, 
when you carry out the teachings of Baha'u'llah for the love of him yes all those things will be yours you will become knowledgeable, you will become wise, you will become deep, you will acquire all those qualities. But you acquire it not because you wanted it at first, for yourself, for the satisfaction of yourself. But you've done it because you love him. Just as much as you, when your beloved asks you something in your life, whom you love very much, when he asks for something or she asks for something, you do it because of him or because of her. This is a good motive. This is a real love. Today, Shoghi Effendi has told us, Baha'u'llah has told us, Abdul Baha has told us that not until we live the life in accordance with the teachings can our work of teaching become successful. This is another thing which is very important to bear in mind. Some of you have remembered that celebrated passage from Shoghi Effendi which I haven't got it with me to read it for you but I'm sure many of you who are familiar with it, this is a celebrated passage when he says, not by the force of numbers. <coughs> not by the force of numbers. Not by a mere uh, disposition of teachings and not by an organized campaign of teaching. Can you influence uh, the people who are not Baha'is and bring them into the faith? I'm paraphrasing his ideas. He says, one thing and one thing alone. One thing and one thing alone. See how much emphasis he puts on it? And there is no other alternative. One thing and one thing alone, he says, which will bring people to the faith, is that each one of us act as mirrors. Mirrors. And we are always acting as mirrors, you know that. Every human being is a mirror of what is inside him. But he says we should act as mirrors which will project and reflect the teachings of Baha'u'llah in its purity, in its pure form. He says then it will influence others. And there are many stories, I'm sure you have heard many, many stories of such beautiful Baha'is who had lived this life in this way. And as they walk in the streets, they have been the center to which people turn to. Remember Martha Ruth was one such person. I mean, she, wherever she went, people were attracted to her. I mean, this is part of our history. And, and this is not something that she was a very special a human being, she was a human being. And that, but she had an absolute connection with Baha'u'llah. She, she, she was connected fully to him. And this is what happened. And therefore she became a perfect mirror. Uh, what was in her heart reflected out in her face. And people saw that radiance and they were attracted to her. This is the way. And this is what Shoghi Effendi tells us. And this is why I said that the world, the forces are all over the world preparing us. We can make, we can, we can bring great numbers into the faith if we do these things. And I'm sure that your community has been really in the forefront of teaching activities. We have to learn from you. I, I'm, forgive me for saying these things. Your community has been so successful in teaching. At one stage, I remember they would say that one percent of the people of this country are Baha'is. And whenever we talk about Alaska, it brings such, it rings such a marvelous community. And now I can say it is. It really is. It's a very beautiful community. You cannot see yourselves, young, because you're sitting there. But I can see this. It's, it's marvelous. And this is not because of us. This is because of Baha'u'llah. He has given us all this marvelous powers. Now, oh, Time is coming, Mr. Chairman, to have a little break. When is your break? Now? I, I want to tell you now, having said all of this so far, we have talked about um, growing our faith. Our faith grows. We want our faith to grow. And we talked about it yesterday in great detail, of the things we have to do. Not that I have said this, but what Baha'u'llah has said. Uh, reading the writings and saying the obligatory prayers. And now we said about living the life. Living the life. But there is one thing that if we don't do it, really, really and really, this is real serious. If we don't do it, all these things will not be of any use. Even living the life would not bring up the results. And I will explain to you what it is next session. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, 
<laughs> we'll take you to nature and you see that in life if there is a man or a person who say eats a lot of food regularly but he does not move can you imagine a person like that never never now never moves he's sleeping all the time eating and sleeping or staying up what will happen to this person this is not going to be a healthy life he's not going to be able to live and even if he lives he'll be a sick man uh, the right way of living is to eat your food and then exercise your muscles and move around and work hard and the harder you work the more you are healthier the healthier you are you see now this is a basic principle of life and exactly the same principle applies in the faith there may be people who say well I will read the writings and in fact he may be a scholar he may become a scholar of the faith he reads everything and uh, he may be talk an awful lot as well but he doesn't serve the faith doesn't do anything that person is going to be unhealthy going to be frustrating the real way of life is to read the writings to say your prayers obligatory prayers to live the life to do all these things we have to do but just as important serve the cause of God and the greatest service today to the cause of God is teaching so you see now how there is a balance here the balance comes into it we are not going to be the people who are going to read and read and become carried away into the worlds of God or something like that but we are going to do these things together we're going to do this so that we can serve the faith although there are many things we can do to serve the faith but I mentioned the greatest of all things in service to the faith is teaching and uh, I'll explain this to you later on why this is that the greatest of all things is teaching now serving the cause uh, has been described to us from age to age, from time to time by Baha'u'llah, by Abdul Baha, by Shoghi Effendi and today by the House of Justice because every period of the faith the time of the Bab for instance it was a period of itself the greatest of the work of the Baha'i Babis then was to teach the faith that was stood in forefront of all other activities but there were other things they had to do as well as teaching which was specific to that particular age for instance uh, if you were a Babi at the time of the Bab you had to teach the faith but you also had to learn how to ride a horse really and to hold your sword for instance this was how it was done uh, it, it was a special requirement of that age then when Baha'u'llah came again teaching was in the forefront of all the activities but then Baha'u'llah said now is the time never to use your sword but to give your life and that was a period of great uh, stories of great heroism and martyrdoms during that period of Baha'u'llah and steadfastness and then Abdul Baha's period you could say again teaching was in the forefront but he said now is the time to remain steadfast in the covenant there was a time that Abdul Baha so much the, the cause was attacked you know at that time during the ministry of Abdul Baha by the enemies from within these are the covenant breakers they attacked the faith with, so f with such fierceness that if it wasn't for, uh, for the fact that as I was mentioning yesterday the cause of God, the machinery, the covenant was so strong and uh, with the help of some heroes of the faith a few who rallied around Abdul Baha like lions and protected the faith today the faith would have been broken up but it was because the machinery of the covenant was so strong they couldn't do it but during the period of Abdul Baha 
The emphasis was on the steadfastness in the covenant. Abdul Baha used to send teachers all over the world to help the friends to remain steadfast in the covenant. We may not have the time to deal with this subject of the covenant, of course we can't deal with everything, but um, now that was a special period again, but again teaching stood in forefront. Now since then Shoghi Effendi's ministry and today the beginning of the formative age, again teaching the cause is in the forefront. But the specific task of today is the building of the institutions of the faith. Now you cannot uh, live in this age and do the things which belong to the other ages. You can't say, well, I'm a Baha'i but I'm going to now learn how to ride a horse and hold a sword in my hand as the early believers used to do. This would be out of place. But you cannot also, if you are going to be a, a really a devoted, devotedly follow the teachings, we cannot stay away from building the institutions of the faith. This is our task. But teaching and building the institutions of the faith are the two major tasks that the Baha'is of this particular period are faced with. Now I want to talk a little bit about teaching, uh, which is really, Baha'u'llah says, the most meritorious of all things in the sight of God. It is not just um, one of the most meritorious, he says it's the most meritorious of all things in the sight of God. Now why is it? And First of all, I want to mention that there is a great, in my view, there is a great misunderstanding in the Baha'i communities about the purpose of teaching. Now, often people think that we teach the faith so that they increase, we may increase our numbers. This is not the main purpose of teaching. This is not the primary purpose of teaching, although other religions do that probably for this reason. But we must not be under this impression. That the main purpose of teaching, I'm saying the main purpose of teaching, is not to increase our numbers. This is a secondary purpose. This will ha come as a result. The result of teaching is that our numbers will increase. But there is a far, far greater reason for teaching the faith. Teaching is an act of devotion to God. It's an act of devotion. Now, I will explain this to you in this way. Again, we go to nature and look at nature to see what teaching is in nature. In nature you will find always any object which uh, depends upon uh, a greater, uh, upon its life giver, any object which depends upon its life giver, you know there, are life, there is a life giver, for instance this earth is a life giver, this earth is the mother earth, isn't it? It is this earth which has created everything, everything which you see on this earth has come about from this earth, this earth. So it's like the mother earth. We all are dependent upon this earth for our livelihood, for our existence. So we are dependent upon it. Now what happens is this, whenever such a thing exists, that this is the source of your life, the source of your um, existence, then all things will be drawn to it. Everything will be attracted to it. Every object, as you can see, is attracted to this earth. Do you notice that? Every object which comes within its gravitational pull is attracted to this earth. This is a love relationship. There is a love between the creator and, this, and all the other things. The, the mother, this earth is like the creator. Is the, is, the, is the creator of all, is the source of life. And so every object which comes within its gravitational pull is attracted to it, just with the force of attraction, which is love. Mm, you see? This is the law of nature. But, and, the, and, and therefore, this, the home of every object is to come down and to rest on this earth. When it rests on this earth, then you can say it has reached its destiny, it has reached its home. For instance, you see this pen in my hand, its real place, the real place for this, uh, for this pen is to come down, to be attracted by this love relationship, to be attracted and eventually rests on this earth. When it reaches on this earth, the lover and the beloved have reached to each other. You see? 
the lover and the beloved have reached to each other. And this is a stage of fulfillment, a stage of pleasure. Pleasure for both. It's, the word pleasure really is, uh, in here you can use it. It's a stage of fulfillment. Now this is a physical thing we are talking about. But as long as my hand is in here, you see my hand here, <laughs> this hand becomes a barrier for this pen to come down and reach its beloved and rests on this earth. Although the force of attraction still exists, there is a force of attraction already even at this time. With my hand in the, in the way, the earth is still want to draw this to itself. But my hand is preventing it. And this pencil now is in dep is a state of deprivation. Because its home is not here. Its home is to come down and be joined with its beloved. Is that clear, this sort of a... This is, this is a principle of life. Exactly the same thing applies between God and man. Exactly. God is the creator of all. And again, as I was mentioning yesterday, we are not talking of the essence of God. Let us not talk of the essence of God, because we said yesterday, clearly, there is no relationship between the essence of God and man. It cannot be with anything. There is no relationship whatsoever. But this is God revealed to man. There is a love relationship between the two. God loves to draw a soul to itself, just as much as this earth loves to draw this pencil to itself. But, men have many barriers in between. Many barriers. We all have barriers. Barriers of veils and barriers. Barriers of, for instance, prejudice is a barrier. It prevents people from recognizing and coming down and becoming united and becoming attracted to their Lord, to their God. Tradition is another barrier. People are born in a tradition and die in the same tradition. It's like being born in a prison and never see outside the prison and then you die in the same prison. This is what most people are like today, tradition. Maybe in this country you don't have so much attachment to tradition, but there are countries in the world that I'm more familiar with where tradition plays a tremendous role. You don't do anything except what is tradition. There are other barriers. Pride is a barrier. Many barriers. Pride. You become proud of yourself and your accomplishments and your knowledge and your quality and your accomplishments. This is a barrier. Knowledge could become a barrier. Again, because it gives birth to pride. So you see, all people in the world, their soul, there is a force of attraction between them and God. Always God wants to draw them. And that force of attraction is there. But these barriers prevent them from coming and united, becoming united with their God. Now, the act of teaching, which only a Baha'i can do, is to remove these barriers one by one. And when the barriers are removed, what happens? All the barriers are removed, the soul is attracted to God. And he says, I believe. That moment when he says, I believe, as, I'm, as we were talking about it yesterday, you know, the, the spirit of faith being born, is when the lover and the beloved reach each other. And this is a state of pleasure. Pleasure. Pleasure for God and pleasure for the soul. Because man and God are the opposite things. And in this life, when two opposites are reaching each other, this is a state of pleasure. It's like the North Pole and the South Pole of a magnet. They're attractive. So you see what teaching is? When you teach the faith, you bring pleasure to God. It's the most meritorious of all things. It's an act of devotion to God because you bring a soul to its God. This is the purpose of teaching. This is the main purpose of teaching. Well, of course, as a result of it, our numbers will increase. That is secondary. Then, 
we can build the institutions of the faith we can but therefore teaching friends is a very it's a spiritual act it is not just something I'm going to teach the faith because the NSA tells me to do it or because the counselors tell me to do it or because the house of justice tells me to do it but teaching is an essential part of the life of a Baha'i and it is something that we all will have to be engaged in there is no question of anybody becoming um, if anybody does not teach the faith well you'll have to think about it yourself it's like a person who eats the food he reads the writings he uh, may know a lot about the faith he says his prayers but he is not serving the faith well you remember I was telling you about this man who eats his food and he doesn't uh, do anything what happens to him well, this, is, this will happen we will not be excited we will not be able to, to do anything in life <coughs> teaching is not something that uh, anybody can say I am too busy for it really except in certain exceptional cases very very rarely you come across exceptional cases there are of course places now that people are prevented from teaching for instance if you are living in the Holy Land you don't teach the faith uh, but in this day and in, in these and all over the world really teaching is the most important aspect of our life uh, if we look upon the writings we find that uh, Baha'u'llah has enjoined on all to teach I will tell you uh, our daily life often prevents us from uh, really getting engaged in in teaching the cause uh, because we are so busy in our life We're so busy we have to do so many things even we have to do so many things for the faith that we have not time to teach the faith and I think this is this is a very wrong way of approaching it uh, in fact uh, I remember some years ago one of the national assemblies told us in Europe uh, that we had uh, appointed a, one of the believers who was a marvelous teacher to become a board member, auxiliary board member. We appointed him as an auxiliary board member. And after a few months, the National Assembly wrote to us and said, What have you done? You have, cho you have made him an auxiliary board member. He was one of our best teachers. And now he doesn't teach the faith. Can you imagine? <laughs> this is very wrong. In fact, one of the first things we say to our auxiliary board members all over now, at least, I, I always advise them, if you want to do anything, you must be teaching the faith yourself it's no excuse because I'm a very busy man and I must not teach the faith teaching the faith is for everyone we found in our home that uh, we're very busy and myself and my wife but, it's, but, but we have to teach the faith no matter how busy you are you have to have a, teach the faith you cannot have an exception there's no exception this is the most important uh, function of a Baha'i and teaching is a personal thing unfortunately things are done in the western world very impersonally and we have got used to the idea of teaching in an impersonal way which will never be right you have to teach on a personal level we do most things in life impersonally have, have you noticed that I, I don't know what life is like here I'm not familiar with America but I know in Europe if you want to do anything, you won't put your name down for it. You give a box number in the newspaper so that nobody will recognize you. You know, it's impersonal. You don't say uh, anything you want to do. You put a notice in the newspapers. You want to sell something. You want to buy something. You want to see somebody. You put a box number. Even when you want to fight with somebody, you don't fight him directly. You employ a solicitor, a lawyer to fight for you. You see, everything is done impersonally here. But teaching has to be done personally. You have to come in contact with the soul. You have to love him. You have to then look into his eyes and love him. 
with your heart until such time that you think he's now ready and then love the faith. Now I want to also say something to you about uh, teaching methods because I feel again this is one of our problems. Uh, but this idea of teaching, now let me first say this idea of teaching, every Baha'i teaches, is something that uh, is so vital like every day we must eat. It's just as important as that. The same way that we said every day we read the writings, every day we must engage somehow in teaching. And it's a daily thing. Shoghi Effendi mentions that. It's a daily thing. It's not once a month going from one town to another. Um, it is something daily. I remember another important thing that I want to mention here before I give you some uh, examples of this is that uh, Abdul Baha mentions this that if we do not teach the faith divine assistance will be cut off from us you, I'm sure you've heard this now you realize that God is very loving to all creation and yesterday we talked about forgiveness you remember that we talked about forgiveness and how uh, God's forgiveness what things it can do with it and I'm sure that God forgives all the uh, things that people do but there are certain things which to a Baha'i he cannot do you see God's assistance reaches the whole of the this creation if ever for one moment the assistance of God is cut off from people they are not able to exist the assistance of God reaches all creation and God does not withhold his assistance from any human being as long as they live he's assisting them in whatever they do if you, do the, if you go the right way he assists you if you go the wrong way he'll assist you even the enemies of the faith are being assisted because God does not interfere in our actions we have the free will he shows us the way yes he sends his messengers he shows us the way he throws light upon our path and he says this is the right way to come but it is up to you to choose it and if you go this way he'll help you if you go the opposite way he also will help you it's like the engine in a car the engine does not decide which way to go but it will give you the power whichever one you decide to go this is how God acts with us this is how he um, and now he acts in this way his assistance reaches all humanity but it will not reach a Baha'i. Now imagine this. Who does not teach the faith. And this is when the Baha'i becomes frustrated. In his life. I become frustrated in my life. I become unhappy. Since I become a Baha'i, I become unhappy. Since I become a Baha'i, I become... I have all kinds of problems. It's the divine assistance which must come to us. And I can assure you that most of the problems that we have in our daily life or in our any, anything we do can be and will be resolved if we become so much throw ourselves into the field of teaching every day then things will happen to us great things great things will happen one will change. Now, I'm not saying that one should say, oh, well, I have a lot of problems in my life, so I better go and do a little bit of teaching so that my problems may be solved. But I can assure you that many of our problems will be so removed from the scene because you will be elevated into a different world and these problems will, will solve, sort themselves out. They will completely go into the background. Now teaching, which is personal thing. Uh, I was talking about somebody the, in one of these gatherings I, I, some years ago. And a woman came to me and she said, look, she said, I have become worried uh, since you have been saying these things. That we must teach the faith every day and if we don't teach the faith, God's assistance will be stopped from us. I said, I didn't say that. It's Abdul Baha who says this. Oh yes, she said, I'm, I'm worried still. I'm still, in any case, I'm worried about it. 
And she said, I am a very, cons very reserved person. I can't go out and talk to the people about the faith. I feel very embarrassed. I cannot teach personally. And now she said, what shall I do? I am worried, he said. She kept on saying this. I said to her, did you say you're worried? <laughs> she said, yes. I said, that's very good. Keep on worrying. That's your solution to your problems. Really, keep on worrying. <laughs> this is a very good solution. If ever we, we are brought to the point of worrying about something, you're going to do something about it. Do you know that? Uh, when you find in your, uh, in your daily life, it's the same thing. If you lose your job or if you, uh, your family has some problem and you begin to worry, then you are going to put one foot in front of the other and something will happen. Well, uh, this lady went away and she came back again. She said, I can't rest. You have to, we'll have to do something, she said. She said, I'm very reserved. I can't talk about the faith to anyone. So eventually, after talking about it, mentioned to her that, look, you can go and even though that you say you are very shy or reserved or whatever it is, go out every day. And she said, that's a good idea. She said, I will give one hour a day for Baha'u'llah. This is a marvelous example. I think we should remember that. Why not give one hour a day to Baha'u'llah for teaching? Two hours a day, maybe, but the minimum. And she said, I'll spend some time shopping, I'll spend some time at home. Why not give one hour a day to Baha'u'llah for teaching? And, and discipline yourself. And she said, I will go out. And she went out. She said, I'll go to a cafe. And I sit there. And she said she went to a cafe for two or three months, regularly. And the next time I saw her, she told me this. She said, it doesn't work. <laughs> she said, I went there for three months, every day. I sat there, and many people came in the cafe and sat in front of me on the same table, shared the table. And she said, I could never bring myself to tell them anything about the faith. And she said, it doesn't work. I've given it up, she said. Now, you see what happened in here, really, and this is another lesson we learned. A very marvelous lesson. You know, God, Baha'u'llah says that once you say you are a Baha'i, and once you enter the faith, He will test you. And always we are being tested. All the time. Remember that. As Baha'is, we are always tested. Now, it's not something that Baha'u'llah has invented and say, I'm going to test the Baha'is. In fact, testing. <laughs> this is nothing new. This is a law of creation. This is a law of creation. Baha'u'llah mentions in his writings, God will test everything. He says, God will, he says, I will split a hair into a thousand pieces. These are almost the words of Baha'u'llah. And each piece I will test. Now, test actually is a law of nature. You go to nature and you find tests. I'll give you an example of this. As long as you're sitting, nothing happens to you. But the minute you move, the air will resist you. If you go on a bicycle, have you noticed? When you are going on a bicycle, do you see how the air will resist you? This is nature. This is test. You are being tested. And the faster you go, the greater are the tests. The greater is the resistance. You see these aircrafts which are built up, which go twice the speed of sound. They go so fast that the air will resist it so much that the metal gets red hot. And they have to have a cooling machine inside to cool it off all the time. Because it goes very fast. Nature will test it all the time. When Baha'u'llah says, I'll split a hair into a thousand pieces and test it, this is true. Because if you look at the atoms, they are all the time under test. Each atom inside it goes through this cycle. Test is part of life. Every one of us are tested every day without knowing it maybe when you become Baha'i especially when you sit in a local spiritual assembly we are tested all the time it all depends how you look at your friend across the table just look at her like this that's enough I'm being tested you know 
you think of, her, of him in a wrong way uh, not with love because Abdul Baha says the standard of consultation is love now if I look at somebody when he says something and I want to hit hard at her you know how it is hit hard saying such a thing I'm being tested hit hard in my heart I mean you know I hope we don't get to action but <laughs> it's no use also to cover it up and be very nice and smiling and then you hate in, the, in your heart or, or dislike in your heart that is what matters what's in our heart you see how we are tested and so I am tested and when I am tested I cannot progress anymore when you cannot pass the test but if you pass the test do you know what will happen in our lives when you are a Baha'i when you pass the test then greater field of service you enter into it you go f you have you will get to do greater service to the faith you will want to do that and as soon as you enter there your tests become greater just like somebody who will go faster just like the aircraft which goes faster your tests becomes greater and this is why people who have had not the capacity to pass the test if they are in a higher position higher functions higher duties they could easily destroy their souls it's like a person who is flying in an aircraft you see if I'm standing on this on this platform and if I fall well it, only I may hurt my knee but if I'm flying in an aircraft and fall that's the end so if I l work in a local spiritual assembly or a national spiritual assembly and I have all these ambitions in my heart and I'm not able to do these things right and I am being always don't pass the test I might hurt myself a little bit I might become irritated I might become cause of problems but it is not fatal and this is why those people who were close to the center of the faith those who were close to Baha'u'llah like man who flies in the aircraft or those who were close to Abdul Baha or those who were close to Shoghi Effendi in the world center they if they had slightest impurities in their lives if there was any feeling of ambition in their hearts that little ambition will be magnified and will destroy them you see this is the history of our faith this is why people who are very close to the center of the faith a little bit of ambition they will be destroyed there is no room for ambition in the faith and especially those who served near the center of the faith their criterion must have been servitude absolute servitude like Abdul Baha he was safe the purest branch was safe the greatest holy leaf was safe because their standard of life was servitude utter servitude and self-effacement but the other family of Baha'u'llah they all had ambitions they wanted to be leaders they wanted to be respected they wanted to be honored they wanted to be somebody none of them endured and none of them could last they all perished destroyed themselves they were very close to the center of the faith but there must have been a lot of other ambitious people and in the faith in locally nationally well they hurt each other and hurt themselves but it is not necessarily going to be fatal so you see friends one of the things to bear in mind is that uh, tests come our way always I remember somebody said uh, there was a very outspoken beautiful woman who passed away a marvelous person who became great she brought so many people into the faith in England and but she was outspoken and uh, she was and uh, she used to say you know when I was not a Baha'i I had no problems she said I had no problems with people I was very happy with everybody I had no problems but as soon as I became a Baha'i then problems appeared after the other you know and this may be in one sense true if you are not able to cope with it uh, if you are not able to um, really uh, approach people with a loving attitude and pass the test God always tests us now this woman that I was talking about who was sitting in a cafe for three months 
and people came in front of her and sat there and eventually she couldn't say anything and she was she said um, although I trusted Baha'u'llah and relied on him he said go out and I will assist you he said he didn't assist me now this is why we, how, we te- how we are tested God tests us to find out how much faith we have in him this is true when you arise to serve the faith you teach and teach and nothing happens and then you say well it doesn't work so what happens really you're, lo- you're losing your faith in him this is how he tests you and when I pointed this to her she said you are right she said I've been tested of course she said it's my fault that this didn't work out it is not Baha'u'llah's fault it's my fault because I was not dedicated enough I was not pure enough I was not uh, taking Baha'u'llah with me every day it's my fault and she said now that you say I'm going to sit there every day I'm going to go every day one hour a day and I will go if it is necessary for years I will not give it up and if anything does not happen it's my fault and she went and you know she was telling us the story after two or three weeks she said a woman came along and sat in front of me she said I couldn't say anything of course to her but she looked at my ring and she said what is this strange lines on your ring oh she said I became so nervous I couldn't say a word now she said I was absolutely nervous and I began to stammer (laughs) I began to stammer and the more I became nervous and stammering this woman became more interested (laughs) she said what is it well I think she told her very little and she said look you better come in here Uh, somebody will explain this to you and well I can tell you this woman is a Baha'i and this other lady is no longer a shy, reserved person. She is one of the best teachers. She is going around and te- teach. You know, it's like a child who has never had a food before. You give him a little taste of it. Once he gets the taste, he likes it then. And then he be- it becomes a habit for him. This is the way teaching is. And I feel the idea of one hour a day, or two hours a day, or three hours a day, whatever you like, you choose, is a marvelous idea for giving ourselves to Baha'u'llah for teaching personal teaching now it is very important in that we must remember the difference between teaching and proclamation of the faith and this is something again that I think in most communities that I am familiar with we are mixing up the two and as a result of this we are not we are harming rather than helping you see I feel that many people who um, hear about the faith and they don't come to follow it up is because of the unwisdom of the Baha'i teacher we say the wrong things at the wrong time we say too much we kill him off in the first encounter (coughs) really we kill him off in the first encounter and this happens I believe a great proportion of people who hear about the faith and do not come in is because of the unwisdom of the friends of our teachers and I will explain to you what I mean by this in, in, in practical terms the first thing which happens is that we are so used in doing impersonal teaching that we think when I hold a public meeting in a town and I advertise it and people come there to hear about the faith I think I'm teaching the faith there I'm not that is not a platform for teaching if you begin to teach the faith there you are going to do some harm now I'm going to explain this to you because I'm sure some of you may be surprised to hear this of course when you go behind the radio television in the newspapers you cannot teach the faith there you can proclaim you can give the message of Baha'u'llah it's very different from teaching to give the message of Baha'u'llah yes you do that in a public meeting in a hotel or somewhere you hold it and you advertise it and people come there because people who come to the public meetings they have never heard of the faith before or you must assume they have never heard of the faith before you cannot teach a person that you do not know that's a basic principle 
But you can give him the message. That's all you can do in a public meeting is to give him the message of Baha'u'llah, what it is. But we must not make an attempt, in my view, 